Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us again in one of our cerebrovascular Q&A sessions of uh, Serial Science Foundations and Swedish Neurosciences Institute. My name is Matthias Costa. I'm one of the cerebrovascular fellows. I want to thank Dr. McDowell for his support and the whole, all, the, all the team in attendance for the support with these uh, sessions. Today, we have the pleasure of presenting with us Professor Vitor Pereira. <clears throat> Professor Pereira is a neurosurgeon specialized in minimal invasive procedures for in, in, in neurovascular uh, brain and spinal cord uh, surgery. He did his uh, training in Sao Paulo and then a clinical fellowship in France in Bicetre and Rothschild Foundation. Then he went on to work in, the, in Geneva in Switzerland for around six years as, a, as the head of uh, interventional neuroradiology uh, over there. And in 2014, he moved to Toronto as a staff physician of the University Health Network, Tor Toronto Western Hospital. Professor Pereira is interested in the treatment of uh, a wide range of uh, complex neurovascular diseases, in inclusive, uh, including uh, ADMs, dural EVFs, large and giant aneurysms, spinal cord disorders, etc. He's uh, performed many of the world first cases uh, using innovative devices in our field, including Squid, Pipeline, Surpass Evolve, etc. He's a leading he's a leading figure in clinical and basic research and on ADMs, aneurysms, stroke. Was the PI in multiple global uh, multicenter studies, including Start Trial. Swift Prime study, Swift Direct, Max Pipe, Cardo Trial, Evolve, and many more that we can uh, that we can uh, <clears throat> mention. Dr. Pereira is highly engaged in education in the field of endovascular. Uh, he organizes advanced training in, in 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 new techniques. Participates in several workshops and courses all over the world. He's a leading figure in our field, and we're very pleased to have him. Thank you so much, Dr. Pereira, for for being with us and you can share your screen. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. It's, it's a great pleasure for me to be here and sharing uh, our experience with, with you guys and also learn from the discussions. Um, I am very happy that we have chosen the topic of intracranial venous diseases to for, for this discussion. This is a, a practice that we have for many years and we've seen a significant growth uh, in the last few years and a lot of interest from our community. And we also have been uh, observing and learning a lot from, from the patients and from the results of these treatments. So I, I work at St. Mm -hmm. Michael's Hospital at the University of Toronto in Toronto, Canada. And uh, this is our hostel, and this, the, the, this is my clinical team, Julian Spears, Tom Marotta, and Danny Diestro. And also they share with me the credits of our clinical activity. And these are my conflicts of interest. I have a clinic, but it's inside the hospital, uh, specialized in, in, in post-attack tinnitus and intracranial hypertension. And I'm a consultant for uh, some companies that produce devices for the treatment. And the post-treatment is a clinic that we, we formed a couple of years ago uh, with all the professionals in our university that were interested in dealing with uh, tinnitus, pulsatile tinnitus, and intracranial hypertension. I, I lead the clinic with Nicole Cancellari, a, a research technologist, and uh, we have an ENT surgeon, we have a neuro-ophthalmologist, we have uh, a group of, of, of uh, other neurosurgeons that are also involved. And we see patients regularly and we discuss in a multidisciplinary fashion some of the cases that may be of interest of the others and also uh, to make a, a, a consensual decision in, in, in situations where the, the care of the patient is not uh, straightforward. And we also have protocols and we have a standard assessment of every patient. And we are hopefully building uh, a practice and an activity that we can use in the future to improve the knowledge on this, on this condition. So these are our... And... Uh, 
intracranial venous diseases is, can manifest in different ways. So intracranial hypertension is just one manifestation of it. Pulsatile tinnitus is another one. And we will talk about those two conditions. But there are other presentations that uh, venous outflow restrictions or obstructions on the flow uh, on the venous drainage of the brain can, can actually relate. And chronic headaches, migraines, high blood pressure, cognitive disorders. I don't want to bring all this, these topics, but I want to leave it uh, with, with you that uh, these diseases or the, some of these conditions can be related to uh, same thing that we observe in intracranial hypertension and, and pulsatile teams. And this is a picture from a paper uh, organized by Ferdinand Hui, uh, who is uh, someone very interested in, in this uh, venous diseases too as well. And uh, it shows the different levels of the venous uh, 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 system and the levels of obstruction and diseases that can also correlate with an, an intracranial uh, venous outflow issue. And uh, talking about the, the veins, it's important just to review the anatomy. This is a simplified version. And we are talking about here the superficial venous drainage, the superior sagittal sinus, the torcula, the transverse sinus, and there's the deep venous drainage draining the internal cerebral veins, the galling vein into the straight sinus. So usually we have the superior sagittal sinus draining towards one side and the deep venous drainage and the cerebellum drain towards the other side. So each transverse sinus may have its role and about 20% of the time uh, we will see one side that will be dominant compared to the other side. So it's important to uh, understand the venous anatomy uh, and also functionally how the brain is draining because uh, if we are dealing with uh, narrowing or stenosis uh, in, in a patient that has intracranial hypertension is different than dealing with that same condition in a patient that has only pulsatile tinges and no signs of intracranial hypertension and on a patient with two uh, fully functional transverse sinus compared to one patient that has only one uh, functional sinus and, and a dominant drainage uh, uh, to a vein that has a, a narrow. And the relationship between the veins and how a venous obstruction in any level can interfere with the intracranial physiology correlates to the circulation of the CSF. So we know that there is uh, the CSF uh, and there is a liquid intertitial fluid in, that it's inside the brain. These liquids plus the blood and, and the brain tissue will, will actually be responsible for maintaining the intracranial pressure. And there is a production of liquid, a circulation inside the brain and a drainage of the CSF into the venous system that can be affected when there is an obstruction on, on the venous system. And the CSF flow depends on a lot of mechanisms, including the pulsatility of the vessels, including the pressure itself, and also including the, the, the difference of pressures between the, the CSF space and, and, the, venous, uh, and the venous space. So the, the CSF is produced and, the, and it circulates and then it's, it gets reabsorbed. And there's the inter, interstitial fluid that uh, only recently we started understanding how this interstitial liquid and the, the, and the, and the CSF -like liquid would be circulating and interacting together. So a few years ago, a theory of, a, of a circulation, intraparenchymal circulation was, was developed. So we, uh, the interstitial uh, uh, liquid comes from the periarterial space and go through the brain, through the perivenular space. And through the perivenular space, most of the CSF is then drained into 
the venous system through the arachnoid granulations. So this is being called glymphatic system. There are different theories and still a lot to learn uh, in this uh, uh, about this circulation. But this circulation will actually be responsible to be to removing the metabolites of the the, the CSF uh, activity of, of the central nervous system activity. And then it's drained through the venous system. And when this is uh, the system is impaired, then it can cause from a single uh, intracranial hypertension itself, but also it can cause some of the other uh, presentations and some of the aging process that's probably related to that as well. So we have uh, written a hypothetical uh, paper a few years ago uh, for neurology. And we actually talk about the relationship between the CSF, the glymphatic system, and how it can influence the, the formation or, of, of the idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And uh, obviously, there are some uh, water channels that are responsible for this drainage itself, but uh, the glymphatic system and the perivenular space and the drainage of the CSF will depend a lot on the venous system. So again, because of that dependency, if there is an obstruction, the venous pressures will go uh, up. Uh, there will be a, re uh, a decrease on the CSF drainage and that is the mechanism of most of these diseases that we study. Let's start with intracranial hypertension. So we, uh, it's, a, it's a disease that is classically called idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So I like to call intracranial hypertension because when we call idiopathic means that we don't know what it's causing, but sometimes the intracranial hypertension, we know what it's causing. It can be a medication or it can be a primary venous narrowing that is responsible for that condition. And in cases like that uh, should be managed completely different than uh, idiopathic, which is probably a biochemical uh, issue on the CSF drainage. So uh, IIH uh, is, is, is prevalent in young female patients. Uh, the incidence is uh, supposed to be 15 to 19 per 100,000 in the United States. And it's also related to obesity. 70 to 90 percent of the patients will present obesity and again when, what is the cause and what is the effect this is why we also have to differentiate the idiopathic from the non-idiopathic hypertension so in in patients that we have a primary venous obstruction uh, uh, when they are treated by any 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 treatment, they actually improve the the and they can better control the weight. And uh, on the other hand, some patients with idiopathic intracranial hypertension without venous uh, diseases, they improve the condition when they actually uh, reduce weight. So uh, we have to start separating those those causes to actually understand better the disease. And the main age of diagnosis is between 28 to 35. And uh, usually the diagnosis is made by an neuro ophthalmologist when these patients come presenting with uh, uh, blurred vision and episodes of, uh, of uh, uh, diplopia and also constant headaches. So the diagnosis uh, is, is classical, uh, it's called modified Dendy criteria. And uh, it's characterized by uh, symptoms of raised intracranial pressure, headaches, blurred vision, brain fog, fatigue, no localizing signs, patient is awake and alert, MRI has no evidence of venous thrombosis, or tumor, and a lumbar puncture has a pressure, an opening pressure of higher than 25. And there's no other uh, explanation for a raised intracranial pressure. So 
the neuro-ophthalmology assessment here plays a big role, not only for the diagnosis, but also for the management. So this is a, an imaging of uh, a fundoscopy showing a papilledema, and the patients uh, usually complain, complain of transient visual obscuration, visual loss, and changes on the visual field. So we usually send these patients to the neuro-ophthalmology and they usually perform a visual field assessment and an OCT, which is uh, optic coherent tomography to actually see the surface of the, of the optic nerve. And, uh, and, and it can actually map and objectively quantify uh, the degree of swelling. This is also very important for the follow-up. Uh, any therapy this patient will, will receive actually is better followed by OCTs because then you, we can objectively grade the, the swelling and not necessarily base the results on, on, on the patient's description because sometimes the visual fields take way, way longer time to, to, be, uh, to see an improvement compared to uh, the OCT improvements. So these are some of the MRI uh, signs, the flattening of the posterior sclera, the optic nerve sheaths are dilated and tortuous, and we have the classic sign of the empty cella. Empty cella is probably one of the easiest uh, uh, signs. It's not that specific. So some patients may have empty cella and, 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 and it, they are not related to intracranial hypertension, but the, the orbital signs, the, the optic nerve sheaths and the, and, and the flattening of the posterior sclera and sometimes the bulging when the swelling is important, those are very specific and, and in combination, uh, these signs uh, are, are highly suspicious of intracranial hypertension. Then, on our assessment, we also uh, perform uh, MRV uh, routinely when uh, we send these patients with a suspected uh, intracranial hypertension diagnosis. Um, and it's, it's already to start performing the assessment of the venous uh, system. And this is a picture here of an MRI venogram showing a bilateral uh, sinus stenosis. Classically, this was always uh, uh, considered to be a consequence of the, of the uh, intracranial hypertension. But more recently, as I described to you at the beginning, uh, we've seen that some of these stenosis or narrowings, they are actually the cause. And uh, these patients uh, will have a very high um, uh, resistance to medical therapy, so they won't improve. They will require all sorts of different medications to control the pressure, and also they will have headaches and they will have other symptoms, and they will rarely improve and have a good quality of life just with medication. And uh, it's important when we see a venous stenosis to characterize between intrinsic and extrinsic. And this is also part of the exercise of understanding where uh, the stenosis is coming from, if it's causing the hypertension or if it's caused by the hypertension. And an intrinsic stenosis will be a short segmental stenosis, usually is a, is a compartment of the sinus that is thrombosed or a large giant uh, arachnoid granulation that is causing an, an obstruction. And you, we can see the, the diameter of the sinus is, is, is of normal size. And then at some point we have a short uh, narrow segment. This is called intrinsic stenosis and an extrinsic stenosis is actually a very long, all the sinus is compressed by the brain. We can see here these images on the coronal slices of an MRI showing the brain pushing and pressing the, the sinus. It will make the sinus flat and the diameter of the sinus will, all along the extension of the transverse sinus will be very small. And at some point there will be a narrow segment as well. 
So this is what we call extrinsic stenosis. And these stenosis, they, they, will, also, they will help us by characterizing between intrinsic and extrinsic uh, already give us an idea of what is causing that intracranial hypertension. And for example, this is a, a picture of uh, uh, one of our papers on uh, the hypothesis of intracranial hypertension. And uh, this picture here show how actually an arachnoid granulation is, is being formed. And particularly on the transverse sinus, we believe that it's actually an extension of the perivenular space and it can obstruct the flow at some point. So we've seen arachnoid granulations that classically were known to be in an, uh, uh, just an anatomical uh, benign uh, structure uh, being related to the drainage of the CSF and causing sometimes stenosis with uh, a potential to change the pressures on the venous system. So extrinsic stenosis, as we said, are stenosis related to the increased intracranial hypertension. And these stenosis will also vary by the patient age. Young patients usually will have extrinsic stenosis, high opening pressure and higher recurrences. And in the adults, we will see more intrinsic stenosis, uh, stenosis that will be related to partially thrombosed compartments or large uh, arachnoid granulations and uh, more uh, symptoms related to the turbulence of the flow and less symptoms related to very high uh, intracranial hypertensive levels. And uh, this is a paper from the Stephanie Lenke group in, in Paris that study a lot of venous diseases. And uh, here they show the, the, what we just talked about, the, the distribution of the extrinsic and intrinsic stenosis amongst the population. So extrinsic stenosis will affect an older uh, population of patients and extrinsic stenosis younger patients that will probably have primary II age or very early on onset of, 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 of thrombosis uh, with uh, healing uh, with a severe narrowing of, of the sinus uh, causing severe hypertension. So there are different ways so therapeutic strategies to treat. Uh, first of all, uh, we have to look for a cause. And again, uh, I, I think there are many causes related to drugs, uh, cyclines, retinoid acid, obesity may also be causing hypertension, increase of the intra-abdominal pressure, and just the volume of, uh, of, of water and the water uh, distribution and the influence in the expression of the aquaparin receptors in obese patients can also be related to that. So it's important to do a full clinical and imaging workup. And again, uh, looking into the venous system to make a, a big picture of what is being causing. And if it's a medical, a medication, or if, it's, uh, if the venous system has no stenosis, uh, then treat the obesity or, and, and treat the drugs. And if uh, we exclude the, the causes and we don't know actually what was causing the intracranial hypertension, then there are three alternatives for that treatment. One is to divert the CSF, so a shunt, a ventricular peritoneal shunt, opening a venous stenosis, venous stent, in case uh, there is a venous stenosis. And uh, the third one is for patients that will have exclusively um, optic nerve sheath edema and losing uh, the vision uh, quickly, that is the optic nerve uh, sheath uh, treatment that can also be offered to these patients. So. In the past, venous stenting was uh, left to be uh, the last option. So most of these patients were sent primarily to shunting, ventricular peritoneal shunting, and venous stenting uh, was one of the therapies. But I think now with the, uh, the, the growth, I mean, 
we are learning more about the disease and we know now that the venous outflow plays a bigger role than uh, we thought and the differentiation between the type of the stenosis and uh, the, the relationship between the venous system directly to the intracranial hypertension uh, is resulting in a growth of the venous stenting and although there is no randomized studies on this disease yet published. Uh, there's a lot of very encouraging single center or meta-analysis showing uh, very good results on the treatment of intracranial hypertension or pusatartinitis, uh, primarily with uh, venous stenting. So this is an approach. Uh, we actually uh, review the cases together in my practice with the neuroophthalmologist and the ENT and the CSF uh, neurosurgery group. Uh, but we've been uh, trying to differentiate the causes and the primary venous hypertension. We've been offering primary venous stent as, as a treatment for these patients. And when we perform venous stenting for this, we always perform in general anesthesia. We use uh, radio arterial access. We perform bilateral common carotid angiograms to evaluate the venous drainage, the dominant side, and assess also the venous anatomy in the head and in the neck. And then through a femoral venous access, we place a long sheath in the jugular. We measure pressures from the heart up, so heart, jugulars, and intracranial, and then once we have the pressures uh, identified and we have the venous drainage pattern, we then start making a decision on which side we will treat. And we always base the decisions during the procedure on the pressure gradients that we calculate. And the pressure gradients are a difference of pressures uh, along a vascular segment. So between two segments, before and after the stenosis or between the heart and the brain, between the heart and the neck and the jugulars. So we use all these pressure gradients to understand the functional uh, aspect of, of the venous drainage. And this is also a paper from uh, uh, Stephanie's uh, group showing that the pressure gradients will change uh, in a patient with conscious sedation and general anesthesia. So they have done a prospective study in where they measure the pressures uh, uh, on local and when the patients went on the genital anesthesia on the same procedure, they showed that the pressure gradients decrease significantly. So we use under general anesthesia four millimeters of mercury. And we usually use a large catheter to measure the, the pressures along the venous system. And, uh, and four millimeters is the pressure graded limit that we consider relevant for, for treatment. And uh, this is a 26 year old patient, two years of severe headaches, presenting with a visual decline a few months prior to the procedure. So this is a lateral view of the of, of the, the case, this patient had a dominant drainage towards that sinus that, as you can see here, although it's covered by the lab bay vein, has a significant narrowing. Procedure was done. Patient had a gradient of 13. After the stent placement, the gradient decreased to one. And the patient had a slow recovery of the vision over three months and uh, is already free of symptoms for three years and uh, even, even more now. This is, this is a case that I, I have prepared a few years ago. So we've been seeing, showing that intracranial hypertension, when we fix the gradient, we correlate with uh, clinical improvement. So if there's no gradient, the chances of improvement are lower, but they sometimes exist because in these extrinsic stenosis sometimes, during the procedure, we will measure the gradients and they, they are not there. But then uh, if the patient is, is left untreated, uh, 
the, the extrinsic pressures will depend on the patient condition. It will depend uh, on, uh, on, on the pressures that the brain are offering on the wall of the sinus. And patients with extrinsic stenosis may have no gradient during a procedure. And this is also another aspect that is important to consider when we are managing those patients with intracranial hypertension. So the results after stents, after, after stenting are very encouraging. Intrinsic stenosis will improve more than extrinsic stenosis. And extrinsic stenosis will be related to the recurrences because this, this, the, the surface of the sinus to be covered is way longer compared to uh, an intrinsic stenosis that is a short segment. So let me show you this case. It's a 51-year-old female patient, had a long-standing intracranial hypertension. Uh, she's a nurse, very bright, uh, had a VP shunt in 2014, had some revisions, but the shunt is functional and had recently having a, a visual deterioration. She knows herself very well. And uh, this is uh, uh, an MRI, two slices, uh, coronal, showing 2013, the sinuses open. And in 2017, you can see here, the sinus are smaller. And we can appreciate here that is actually the brain pushing these sinuses because of the long standing uh, consequences of the intracranial hypertension. And this is the appearance of this long, small segment, extrinsic stenosis. So this is the angiogram. Because of the, the sinus is flat, sometimes you look, you don't see an obvious uh, narrowing. This is why it's important to use the gradients to guide ourselves during the, the procedures. So for her, she had a very high gradient. And although doesn't have like a, a, a gap, like a, a clear intrinsic uh, narrowing. And we place the stand, we measure the pressures. So two stents on the side. We'll talk about stents uh, in, in a couple of uh, slides. So we, we use carotid stents. This is, these are wall stents. Uh, we use also some peripheral venous stents. Uh, we don't have specific devices for intracranial venous disease, which is which is a a problem sometimes. Uh, and this is the result on the right side. Then we treated the left side, so we saw that it was a long segment. So we tried to go further uh, into the superior sagittal sinus. This is why it's important to do. Uh, the assessment of the venous drainage to understand where the deep venous system is draining and where the superior sagittal sinus is draining in case we need to actually extend the stenting into the tocula or on the proximal portion of the superior sagittal sinus. So this is the stenting on the left side. Very good results. You saw that the sinus were open. Usually we don't need angioplasty for these extrinsic stenosis because the radial force of the stent is enough to expand the vessels. So patient was free of symptoms for six months, the papilledema improved, but then she had a recurrence of the IIH symptoms uh, after that. So we did a, an imaging. So this is a, a sagittal slice showing the sinus before the stenting and the sinus for nine months after the stenting, we can see here the proximal portion of the superior sagittal sinus is actually narrowed. Again, extrinsic stenosis, the brain pushed. So this patient uh, had the IIH causing the venous stenosis. This is why uh, the, the dependency on, on, on the pressures and on the shunting uh, and, and the risk of recurrence uh, adjacent to the stenting that we used. So we actually brought this patient back. She had a huge gradient again uh, adjacent to the stents and we went and extended the, the stents and we fixed the gradients. And uh, 
this is actually the most common cause of recurrence of uh, post stenting of uh, intracranial hypertension for cases where the stenosis is intrinsic and the, vein, the veins are the primary cause of the intracranial hypertension, uh, the, the results are very good and uh, these patients rarely will recur uh, with uh, IIH symptoms. So our, I, I think that uh, we need more prospective data and there's a number of studies being planned and being conducted uh, to demonstrate the real benefit. But I think we should be looking towards assessing these patients with intracranial hypertension, uh, thinking that uh, this is not a completely idiopathic disease. They can be related and can be caused by the venous uh, obstructions. And the venous obstructions can happen in any level. And that uh, if the venus is the primary cause, probably that should be the primary treatment as well. So now let's talk about another manifestation of intracranial venous out outflow restrictions or another man presentation of um, diseases that, that can be related to the veins. And one of them is, is, is pulsatile tinnitus. And pulsatile tin tinnitus is the is is a uh, is uh, uh, the the patients are hearing something without an external source, and the hearing is is actually a very uh, a very powerful uh, sense, uh, and this is a, this is a nice. Uh, So it can calm us, it can excite, and the hearing impacts our life tremendously. So I love cello. I'm learning how to play cello, and it's always my therapy on Fridays when I come home after a busy week. And uh, the, the, the hearing influences our lives tremendously. And tinnitus, having a noise without an external cause, it, it, it can disturb the patient's life and quality of life uh, tremendously. And overall, tinnitus is a very prevalent uh, disease. It can affect 10 to 15% of people. If, you know, some people will have a very low level or very mild tinnitus, and, and the perception of the sound can be different, clicking, buzzing, hissing, hurrying. Uh, part of these tinnitus, can be pulsatile. And pulsatile means that it has a rhythm that is sometimes the same as a heart beat or the same of the heartbeat of the patient. And usually the pulsatile tinnitus, they can be related to vascular causes and some of them are, are curable. So class, classically, uh, pulsatile tinnitus had been associated with uh, uh, paragangliomas or dural fistulas, but more recently, probably, pulsatile changes are more related to venous diseases than anything else. And uh, this is a recording of one of our patients with uh, a dedicated recording system that we have been developing. And this is actually what these patients can actually hear. <laughs> So a, a lot of patients can actually record the sound that in, in the ear or around in the mastoid area. And this was a patient that actually presented a venous narrowing. And, uh, and we recorded this sound by putting a, a vibration microphone inside the ear of the patient. And you can imagine how disturbing it is to live with a sound like that in your ear 24-7. So a lot of these patients uh, present with, uh, uh, with a very low quality of life, a lot of anxiety and depression, uh, 
we've done an assessment in our clinic and uh, they, they, re they report uh, a low quality of life in 80 plus over 10 uh, um, compared to other patients. And uh, it affects the ability to concentrate, sleep, relationship with families and friends, uh, disturb social uh, activities and can have an impact in life in general in 83%. And also they have, uh, they are associated with a very high uh, suicidal rate compared to uh, uh, the general population. And uh, a lot of- uh, Hi, my name is Hi. A lot of uh, issues uh, on on work and also uh, on on productive as well. Some of these patients with pulsatinges they can have uh, intracranial hypertension symptoms. Although uh, intracranial hypertension patients will present with the visual symptoms, pulsatinges patients, particularly when they have bilateral stenosis on the sinuses, they will have MRI signs of hypertension but they don't have yet the optic nerve swelling, but they have a terrible quality of life because they also have a lot of headaches and some symptoms, cognitive disorders that they report as, as brain fog that can also be correlated to that. In our series, uh, uh, probably more than 35% of the, the cases of pulsatile changes will have some degree of uh, intracranial hypertension on uh, MRIs or also on uh, ophthalmological assessment. So, and uh, there are very many causes. So, pulsatile tinnitus has to be seen differently. A lot of these patients complain that you know, they go to many physicians, and whenever they talk about tinnitus, that is uh, usually something that no one pay attention, no one investigate. But one thing I want to emphasize here is that when the tinnitus is pulsed at you or when the tinnitus is a washing or when the tinnitus has a rhythm, then it can be related to a, a vascular cause, then we should see these patients differently and we should actually send these patients for a vascular imaging. AV fistulas, tumors, arterial dissections, carotid stenosis, they can all produce brood and they, this brood can also uh, resonate and, and to the ears. And paragangliomas are also lesions that are associated with uh, pulsatile tinnitus. And uh, although uh, classically the venous diseases were less understood. We believe today that they are probably a major cause of pulsatile tinnitus. And a different venous lesions can cause uh, the, the, the sound that we are talking about. So venous stenosis is the classic uh, disease. So that is a narrowing and a turbulent flow. Uh, sinus thrombosis, large arachnoid granulations can also be related to uh, the, the, the production of sound and EG, intracranial geopathic hypertension by ex, causing an extrinsic stenosis can also be related to that. And then there are some uh, veins that are crossing the ear or close by or erosions on the bone, uh, the hisenses that can also cause uh, uh, postatar tinnitus. So this is a, a patient that we uh, had uh, treated with pulsatile tinnitus. She had this a large arachnoid granulation. I'll just stop here the video. And we treated, she was cured after the procedure. And uh, we actually took the 3D of the venous uh, system and we, 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 we actually simulated. This is a flow, a simulation of flow. We, we estimated the flow of the venous drainage of the brain and we sent to a solver and we, we use an algorithm to actually uh, sonify the, the, the velocity curves and the flow that we actually see here. So this is a simulated uh, computer fluid dynamic simulation and also with a sonification method to reproduce the sound that 
we were actually good here. And we did it pro after the, the treatment and uh, the patient actually recognized this this was the sound that she actually recognized to be closer to what she used to hear in the past. And looking to these curves, uh, the, the interpretation is that there is a, a narrowing that increased the speed of the velocity of the flow and then cause a turbulent flow that can actually resonate through the bone. There are different frequencies and uh, there are some that can resonate through the air or through the bone. And we published this last year in, in JNIS. And, uh, and you can see here the area of turbulent flow close to the inner ear structures. And that was actually what was causing the, 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 the noise that the patient was hearing. And when we did a simulation without stent, uh, this turbulent flow disappeared and also correlating with the clinical outcome of that patient. So again, we assess all these patients in this clinic. We assess them for quality of life, ophthalmological assessment, uh, venous imaging, uh, and we try to understand what is actually causing the noise. So it overlaps with the IIH practice, but also has uh, a lot more because we have to do sometimes dynamic imaging here, uh, MRI, not only venous, but uh, also to exclude arterial venous uh, fistulas and, and, and tumors. And uh, the patient usually goes through all of us or, or at least one of us. And then we review at the end of the clinic all the cases and we, we try to find a cause for, for the tinnitus and see if there's a treatment that we can propose or define how best investigate these cases. And uh, during the examination, we evaluate the head and we try to uh, uh, maneuvers of head movements to, and, and see how it correlates with the, the tinnitus uh, positions that makes it better and worse. And particularly the compression of the jugular vein on the side of the tinnitus uh, uh, if it stops the noise, the, the tinnitus, it, it correlates, it, it has a high correlation with uh, uh, treatment success in patients with uh, intracranial stenosis. So um, there are other causes of, uh, of, of pulsatile tinnitus diseases around the inner ear, but also a lot of the diseases at the level of the neck and uh, it's very important to understand the role of the condylar vein and mastoid MSI veins, evaluate the presence of occlusions here uh, at the level of the neck that can also induce a reflux on, on veins uh, in the retomastoid area or in the condylar area that can also be correlated with uh, postal changes. And here is a list, sinus stenosis, uh, IIH, high riding jugular bone, bone dehiscence, all these uh, lesions can be caused uh, or correlated with a pulsatile tinnitus. So again, the stenosis define extrinsic and intrinsic. They are by far one of the most common causes of pulsatile tinnitus. And we also look for IIH symptoms to try to separate the group with and without IIH for follow-up purposes, and also for uh, to understand the, the disease. And uh, these are some of the signs that we see. High rising jugular bulb is when the jugular bulb goes into the, the, the temporal bone. So it's, it's high, there's uh, uh, different classifications, but actually, as you can see here on the picture, the, the jugular bulb can, can be very high eroding the bone, the bone and can cause a turbulent flow that will be transmitted and, and produce the, the noise.
and the heat sense is actually an erosion of the bone at the level of the sigmoid uh, sinus, and it can be related to uh, uh, postatar tinnitus, a diverticulum as well. It's a protrusion of the vein inside uh, the mastoid or inside the temporal bone. It can also be related to uh, uh, postatar tinnitus. The presence of large emissary veins, they can also be producing uh, tinnitus and ego syndrome, which is actually the compression of the jugular vein by the styloid process. And the C1 uh, vertebra uh, in the neck can also be one, uh, causing uh, postatar tinnitus. So we assess the cases looking for all these potential causes. Uh, and we try to characterize also the pattern of the noise and the impact on the patient quality of life. We try to understand if there is an association with intracranial hypertension or not. And then uh, we discuss in a multidisciplinary way what will be the best treatment. Not all these cases have an uh, endovascular solution. Some will have to have a surgery, uh, surgical procedure to uh, remove the styloid process. But let's see on the endovascular side what we can do. This is that patient that we treated, that we did the simulation. She had 59 years old. She was hearing ocean waves and quite disturbing, very severe impact on quality of life. Uh, and these are images on CT and MRI of the obstruction. And here on the lower row, the images of the stent. So I used a short stent the covering the, the narrowing. And uh, this is this is the result that she was cured after that. So the venous stenting landscape today is, is we, we use stent mounted devices, uh, six to nine French wall stent precise silver. Uh, they are not the best stents to navigate. They are mounted between the jugular and the sigmoid uh, junction, uh, these devices can be pretty stiff to navigate, not, not that easy. Uh, and we really lack of a good device uh, for uh, the treatment of these, these cases. So this is a case that I actually was trying to navigate a silver stand through the sigmoid, the jugular sigmoid junction, and actually it uh, the tip of the device broke. So during the procedure, I actually had to snare uh, the distal end of the stent and a procedure that supposed to be a few minutes, just put a stent over a stenosis and sometimes do an angioplasty here and there. Uh, at the end, had uh, to, to be a longer procedure because I had actually to remove the tip and then look for a smaller stand. So on that perspective, that is also, they need sometimes, as we, we've seen on the case that I showed you before on the recurrence, they need to cover a very long surface of the sinus and we don't have long stents there long enough. And if they are long enough, they are too big and then they will cause a lot of uh, post-procedural headaches and uh, these, uh, we have sometimes to use multi overlaid stents, which is also not, not, not the best option. So recently we were, we, we evaluated a stent that's called boss stent. It was designed for the neuro. Uh, and it's a self expandable stent over a five French system. And it's a braided design, so it can accommodate to different diameters, similar to our arterial intracranial stents. So this is the, some uh, slides comparing the radial force between this stent and the wall stent. And this is a case that we did last month. So a patient presenting postatar tinnitus and uh, some severe narrowing segments And these are images of the procedure. 
so common angiogram to understand the venous drainage. And we also do 3D arrays. And as you can see here on the 3D, we can see the narrowing that sometimes on 2D, it's hard because the, the, the sinus is flat. So we navigated here uh, five French uh, Navian, distal access catheter. This is a prograde device that we use to measure the pressures, but also to navigate the five French device and and then through the five French, we actually navigated the stand. So we do probably about a hundred of these procedures every year, and they are very effective. They have low risk, but technically sometimes. Uh, these procedures take long just because of the access. So I was very excited to evaluate this technology because it simplifies a lot the process. And as you can see here, that is the time that it's taken to deploy. Uh, and it's a system that we understand, empty catheter, uh, braided stent. And it has a good radial force. It has lengths that can cover with one stand, the surface of, of the sinus. I'll just move the video. This patient had an intrinsic stenosis. We had to do an angioplasty. And this is the final result before and after. She had a pressure gradient, although she presented with postatartinges and it improved. So this is another case, 42 year old. Again, 3D showing the the segmental narrowing. And complete resolution of the post changes after. So another case, this case had a stenosis and uh, dehiscence. So had this, this uh, erosion of the bone. And cases like that, we actually or coil or cover uh, that dehiscence with two stents. This is actually what we did. We used two stents to fix the stenosis, the narrowing, and also to cover the, the and she woke up with, uh, without pulsatile changes. So this is a very encouraging uh, field on the stenosis. And I, 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 I hope that they keep improving this technology and making this procedure for uh, sinus stenosis uh, uh, safer. And uh, for all the other causes of venous lesions that can be related or not, we actually do a diagnostic balloon test occlusion and we do a diagnostic angiogram to exclude fistulas. And uh, before treating any of these other conditions, we perform a balloon test occlusion. We occlude the jugular uh, at that level. And if the patient improves, then we treat, and the treatment is actually stent-assisted coiling. So this is uh, an example of a high-rising jugular bulb where we place a stent from the sigmoid to the distal end of the, of the uh, jugular, and uh, we coil the portion of the high-rising jugular bulb. And we don't do this, we only do this on patients that we did exclude everything, we exclude fistulas, and we did a balloon test occlusion and they improved on that. So uh, emissary veins can also uh, be related to uh, uh, the noise, to the pulsatile tinnitus. This is a patient that had actually uh, a pulsatile tinnitus and when he would press that area, he would improve. And as we know, this is the retromastoid area. He had a large emissary vein, we occluded and he improved. So, can be easy cases like that. This is a patient with ego syndrome, compression of the vein here, and a reflux into the condyla veins. Uh, usually these cases, they have, they can be operated on, remove the styloid process by the ENT surgeon, and usually the tinnitus is, is gone. If not, uh, we can always coil uh, 
on a on a on a second stage the the condylar vein on the side of the postalpine. So there are different strategies. It's a multidisciplinary area, and I'm just showing here the most common head and neck causes of postalpine. So you guys can think about and and uh, not everything will be treatable by us, but uh, a lot of things we can at least diagnose. And uh, this has been the the results of our our procedures. So there are different scales, but we see a huge change on the quality of life when uh, we are conducting the treatments for postatite teams. So uh, with that, I want to thank you guys for uh, the invitation. I want to thank uh, my team and, and the clinic for uh, for the work we've been doing uh, so far. And uh, I want to encourage everyone to think more about uh, the veins, uh, particularly on cases with intracranial hypertension and pulsatile tinnitus. And uh, this is a very exciting practice and uh, we can improve and have a big impact on, on the lives of many patients. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pereira. It was an amazing presentation full of cases. Uh, you, you can stop sharing if you want, and we'll move on to the to the questions. So the, the first one is a very practical question. Uh, you, you mentioned a lot about it, but I just wanted to ask you. So how do how can you practically differentiate between extrinsic and intrinsic intrinsic compression when when the when the extrinsic extrinsic cause is not so evident on on images? Yeah, so usually it's it's on a MRI, MRV. It's the easiest uh, method to differentiate. Uh, the intrinsic stenosis, they would be very short, uh, narrowed segments, uh, and the sinus will have a normal size. So you compare with the other size, and they will be at least five millimeters diameter uh, and along its its own its its length and a short segment will be uh, narrowed uh, with different degrees and the extrinsic stenosis uh, from the torcula to the sigmoid the sinus will be all small all flat and compressed so the coronal views on mri are not uh, are important because we can see actually the brain pushing and and this is important because when we do an angiogram if, if we only do 2D imaging, the, the sinus will all look small, but not look uh, narrow. That is not a, a, a abrupt narrowing, obvious. And, and these are cases that the, the treatment is actually have to be based on the pressure gradients, but the MRI is the best method to make that differentiation. Okay. And the, regarding the pressure gradient, you mentioned that General anesthesia. I mean, there are papers showing that general anesthesia can change your gradient, and sometimes you lose the the difference. So, how do you? Do you I mean, how do you correct? Do, do you do you correct that uh, that difference somehow? Uh, I am not so sure if I understood the question. Let's say that you have a high clinical suspicion of the pathology, but in IAH, but you have a normal gradient under general anesthesia. How do you correct for that? How do you how do you know that you're green? No, you just yeah. So yeah, I, I understood. So, sorry. Uh, the 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 gradients. Uh, so some uh, we we are we always look for guidance in medicine. So the pressure gradients we measure the pressure from before and after the stenosis and uh, classically there are all different numbers uh, that you know, we would accept as an abnormal and a recommendation for treatment. Uh, so we have to, to be careful because if it's an intrinsic stenosis, then the gradient will be relevant, will be important. But if it's an extrinsic stenosis, you may have no gradient, but because the, the pressures depend on the intracranial pressures as well, and then the gradient may not be there. And the general anesthesia, because it changed the pressures on the venous system, on the thoracic, and also re relax, remove the, the reduce the pulsatility on the brain, it can interfere with the intracranial pressures in different levels and can interfere with the gradients. 
So that was an observation that was done in Paris, that paper that I cited that up to 50%, uh, it, uh, the, the general anesthesia can decrease the gradients up to 50%. So it's just for us to have uh, that notion in mind. So if you find a very low gradient in a patient under general anesthesia, uh, you, you have to think that that gradient is actually two times higher probably because uh, if, if, if compared to a patient that is, that is non. In the past, I used to do the pressure gradients with the patients awake and then put them under general anesthesia. But actually, uh, I, I don't do anymore because, you know, it, it will increase the length of the procedure. And I think with a good preoperative assessment, we know that we will treat already and the pressure gradients will be less diagnosis, that there's less diagnostic during the procedure and more a procedure guidance. So this is why I stopped doing and I put patients under and I will use the gradients, even if it's a small one, uh, before and after the stand, I want to see a change on that gradient. Okay. Actually, can I, can I jump in there as well? I'm, I mean, what I'm hearing just to be uh, devil's advocate here is I'm hearing that you're sort of abandoning the gradient as a, as a, as a useful measurement. You're making your decision before the procedure as to whether or not a stent is indicated. And if the patient is asleep and there's no gradient, you say, well, it's because they're asleep, but maybe there was no gradient. I, I don't, I'm not quite following that leap of faith, I guess. Yeah. So the, very, very good point. Uh, Sometimes, uh, you know, the the, the pressure gradients on a patient with an extrinsic stenosis will depend on the intracranial pressures. I, patient I had the lumbar puncture a few days before patient uh, had uh, increase on the medication, and you you will sometimes not see that that segment that is intermittent. Uh, up and down, up and down, and contributing to the symptomatology of the patient, you will not see a gradient because at that moment, it, the gradient was not there. But when the patient wakes up, the gradient will appear because it's, it's, it's just dependent on the intracranial pressures. So on those cases made me uh, actually, uh, when I'm treating IA patients that come from the neuro-ophthalmologist with max medical management and worsening on the uh, optic nerve swelling. And uh, we see the on MRI, the extrinsic compression. So I go and treat that case independent of the, of the gradient, because on that case, the gradient is intermittent and will not have a diagnostic value for, for me during the procedure. But obviously we like to see a gradient and I like to see the gradient being fixed by the stent. Um, and I use four millimeters as my lower uh, range, but for cases with IAH, uh, objective worsening and extrinsic stenosis, uh, I don't see the value of, of gradient and I don't use, I just go and, and right. treat the case. So do you, do you require a minimum threshold of uh, venous pressure to, to treat then? So if you, the patient's under asleep, you've, you're confident from your um, MRI that the patient uh, has the stigmata of IIH, uh, you do your venogram and there's no gradient in normal venous pressures, you would still treat that? Yeah. And, and just a technical point, um, the pressures that you are measuring, you said to use a large catheter. I'm wondering what, what you're calling a large catheter for the pressure measurements. And yeah, we use a 32 or a five French catheter. So a micro catheter, uh, you know, 21 or 17, we've seen a lot of variability because uh, we use actually the, the water pressures from anesthesia. So. Uh, the, from the anesthesia card and you, you know if the catheter is long it doesn't it takes a long time to get a stable measurement and uh, comparing with the five French the five French is more more reliable and give a more stable signal and, and you don't worry about the larger catheter um, uh, altering the, the stenosis 
exacerbating that's, the stenosis. I, I, I do. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So the, any catheter passing through the stenosis may, may, may open it a little bit or may also obstruct if there is a stenosis here in the neck. So that, that's a good point, but that's the limitation of, the, of my uh, pressure monitoring system. Uh, ideally, I would like to have the pressure wires that are thin, can be navigated over a 17 right. micro catheter. At least in my reality, these are very expensive uh, devices and uh, I wouldn't be able to use it for every single case. But I think I agree with you. Ideally, we, need a, we would need a wire uh, to uh, influence uh, as minimum as possible the, the lumen of the venous system. And, and I, was, I was really intrigued uh, by your uh, simulation of the sound uh, with, with the flow dynamics uh, and, and creating the audible sounds. You said it was a high frequency, but the false synchronous breweries, I mean, I think is a relatively low frequency. I mean, if you, if you think of the pitch of it versus, you know, the, the high wine tinnitus that, that people get from, uh, from non-pulsatile tinnitus. And I was just wondering, um, is the, is the frequency that you're predicting based, based on your computer simulations, what, what frequency is that at? Like, is it, is that the, the real frequency that the, the, sound is created or, or how, how does that correlate? So the, the, the sound is, uh, that we could reproduce what the, pa the, 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 the sensation of the patient, that, that was the sound of the turbulent flow. So that simulation is, is high frequency because we, to capture those turbulent flows, we actually have to, uh, uh, capture, uh, over, a cycle like a like a, a heartbeat, uh, a thousand uh, a thousand uh, points, and only when we do these high frequency simulations we can capture these complex patterns. So the the I was mentioning high frequency of that is the method of the computational fluid dynamics that we use to capture those turbulent sounds, and and. The sound is produced mainly by that uh, that uh, the erratic uh, sounds and and right. yeah we are we are doing a series of those to understand which amplitude and to understand how us how much uh, turbulent flow can actually resonate through the bone or through the air and produce the sound to. Uh, for now, it's uh, completely academic and experimental, but some of these cases, we don't understand how that venous disease can correlate with the sound. We aim that in the future, we can use the simulation to also guide our clinical decisions on post specific. But, but, the, but the computational flow dynamics, you're actually sort of somehow measuring the, the frequency, the vibration of the flow of the, of the, of the pulsatility and, and coming up with a frequency number. Like you're, you're, you're able to say that, it, that it's at 10,000 Hertz or 5,000 Hertz or whatever. Yeah, we, it, we, es we estimate, yeah, we, we calculate, yeah. We can calculate flow, we can calculate speed, wash stress. So- But, but uh, to get to the, but to get to the sound, you're, you're determining of something that's vibrating to, to create the actual sound. Yeah, the sonification was an algorithm that we took uh, 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 some of the, the signals. So we we use something that's called uh, SPI. So we took the 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 frequencies that were uh, very high, and then uh, we we put a cutoff and then we took that and then we we reproduced as a as a sound signal and we we use different parameters until we were able to actually get the sound that you 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 heard and then 
uh, we, we then started measuring along the vessel uh, how much uh, that sound was uh, being produced in every segment. And then that is the method that we use to uh, get the, the sonification. So you worked know, from what, what the sound that the patient said that, yes, that's what I hear. And then you worked the kind of backwards from that rather than the other way around. We, we did completely independent. We played for her when the, we had already the, 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 the sound, uh, but we, yeah, she, she, we didn't use her description to, to guide us through, but we used different thresholds to actually get a sound some some if we we were getting a threshold too low so we had too many frequencies inside the simulation we would get a erratic sound that would be too not pulsatile or mixed or high pitch uh, and when we get to that threshold that we use then we could get a pulsatile sound and then that's where we 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 then measured along the the sinus, and then we showed the patient after. Yeah, and so you're you're picking velocities in the in the audible range, so like twenty to twenty thousand hertz or something for a young patient. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really, that's really fun. I just think that was a really cool uh, idea. And I want to ask one more question. Sorry, Matthias, I kind of jumped in here. Um, on that patient you showed, where you extended the stents, the young nurse bilateral and up into the sagittal sinus you, you one of the stents was a different stent than a wall stent and then on on the on the recurrence it looked like there was a, a kind of a focal stenosis in the straight sinus as well that that uh didn't look like it was addressed you didn't think that was significant or what what and, and i just want to ask about you know why the different types of stents was it just technical deliverability and and whether um if if you've seen or had to treat straight sinus stenosis? I, I have done once, one, one straight sinus stenosis. These are a little bit harder to diagnose and to correlate with the clinical symptoms. So for her, we uh, the, the superior sagittal sinus was clearly uh, changed and was significantly narrowed and we had a huge gradient over there. So I have decided to do the, the, the superior sagittal sinus alone. Uh, we had one patient that I had to treat the straight sinus, but it's, it's, yeah, these cases are very hard to define and technically they're a little bit more challenging, uh, measuring the pressures across the straight sinus and sometimes the distal portions of the superior sagittal sinus are, uh, are they are a little bit difficult and i think the main challenge is 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 to make the diagnosis that and of the relevance of that that narrowing probably there are a lot of patients there with uh, straight sinus stenosis but it's just that yeah Clinically, they are they are harder to to diagnose, and technically, yeah, yeah I I had done once in my in my career. Yeah, have you ever Great done? Work. Thanks, thanks so much for your. Um, uh, I cannot recall doing a straight sinus stent. Um, I, I I mean I've I've seen some that were um, mm. we evaluated and measured, but it's, you know meningioma uh, stenosis that sort of thing. Uh, but in terms of like an idiopathic or thing, no, I have not. Um, yeah, great, great presentation. Thanks so much. And, and uh, thanks for answering my questions, uh, Matthias. I'll get out of the way. So in, in your experience, do you have a better like clinical resolution in extrinsic or intrinsic uh, etiologies? What, what is your experience in general? Intrinsic, they, they will respond better to stance. So the, the IIH or pulsatile tinnitus or chronic headaches, they will respond very well. Mm -hmm. The extrinsic stenosis, they will be related to the recurrences because uh, you, you know, these patients will develop adjacent stenosis or stenosis adjacent yeah. to the stent. So, uh, and these are patients with more uh, chronic uh, IIH. So the pressures have been high for so long 
and the wall of the sinuses are all flat they are all soft and they they can present these uh, narrowings uh, uh, this flattening of, of the sinuses uh, more easily compared to patients that had newly diagnosed okay uh, in, in patients with fast optic deterioration, visual deterioration. Do you, do you go first for a stent, for a CSF diversion? How do you manage this? Because you burn the bridge with the dual antiplatelets and the surgery and, you know, it's complicated. Very good point. No, these cases we shunt. So uh, stent will take a couple of days to, uh, to actually control the pressure and the swelling on the nerve. If the patient is rapidly deteriorating, our experience with stent is not good. So... Uh, we, even if the patient will need a stand after, so we shunt them and then uh, to save the vision. And then uh, after, despite of the shunting, we, we have a number of patients that present severe headaches or that cases where the venous are the causes, they will have brain fog, they will have other things that we sometimes consider treating them uh, but on the acute phase, the shunting is what we've been doing. Our results of stents are not. Okay. What is, your, what is your protocol for dual antiplatelets in these patients? For how long you keep them? How do you check? I I keep them three months in dual antiplatelet. I use ticagrelor and aspirin, and I keep aspirin for one year. Okay. Do you, in cases of bilateral, you, you see that the patient is symptomatic, has bilateral stenosis. Do you choose upfront to stent both or you go to the most affected side and wait to see what happens how is your uh, decision i yeah for iih i see the dominant side on the on the angiogram and i will start from that side uh or i will use the pressure gradients on both sides and usually the, the biggest pressure gradients that's what i will attack first so i will treat one side and then measure the pressures. If the pressures are, if the gradient disappear with one, uh, one the treatment of one side, I leave it up there. I, I don't treat the contralateral side. Okay. And uh, regarding the regarding the superficial venous system, uh, have you ever had a problem with LAVE, covering LAVE, some kind of ischemic complications or edema? I, I have not, but I, I had a, one of my former fellows uh, just ha had uh, uh, a complication. So uh, a big labé thrombosed, patient had to do craniectomy. Uh, and uh, I, I reviewed the, his uh, procedure and I, my, my, I think that he was using a, a, a stent that he could compress too much. So he was, the stent actually move there was a big arachnoid granulation and during the deployment the i think the stent was too compressed in front of the labe i was surprised that uh, he had this thrombosis because usually labe is is very well anastomosed with trola and with the superficial sylvian vein uh, i i think this patient that patient had uh uh, some coagulation issues or was not well once aggregated because even if we see a stagnation, if there is a little flow and the patient is well once aggregated, uh, there is time for the venous system to reorganize and a lot of the lab vein, even if it's closed, will be drained by another system. I rarely see an isolated lab vein that is not connected to any other system on the surface. So that is the only report I have mm -hmm. on the on a on a venous thrombosis, and I I think was the the stent pushing the origin of the vein, but also she probably had an anti-aggregation issue, anti-coagulation issue. Next question is related to the choice of stents in length. Do you do you do you try to choose? Uh, long stent, stent up front in intrinsic compression to avoid recurrence and shuxta, you know, shuxta stent stenosis or how do you choose your, your length of stents? 
Yeah, so if it's if I'm treating an intrinsic stenosis, intrinsic stenosis on a post-attack tissue patient, I take a stent that's short just for that segment. If I'm treating IIH, it's different. Then I try to cover as much as I can on the surface of the sinus. Uh, I I showed you this this new stent from a startup from from California that I'm I'm evaluating. Uh, it, if that stent works and, and it seems to be very good, I will change my practice because they have uh, long lengths. So they come and I use short stents on in three six stenosis because I don't have the availability of the long stents and they are the long ones. They are too big and they they patients have a lot of headaches after. So I uh, I will probably change my practice with this new stent and use as long as I can, covering the surface of, of the sinus as best as I can. Okay. And do you have any opinion on the silver stent? Some, some groups are publishing the results with silver and they say that it's longer and... Uh... Yeah, I do. I use, I use silver stent. You see that, that device that broke, that was the tip of a silver stent. Uh, the, the patients, this is a, a Venus stent. It's a laser cut. Uh, I've seen a lot of headaches. It's stiff to navigate, and it has uh, opposition issues when you have different diameters, mismatch of diameters on the vessel. And I've seen a lot of instant stenosis uh, with the silver. So I, I've been, it's before this new stand was was the stent that I use the most for IIH cases because of the length and but it's not a device that is uh, comfortable. It's hard to mount. It's stiff and has a lot of pain on the post op uh, related to that. So yeah, that, that was one of the questions. What, what do you think about uh, post operative headaches over the stent zone and why do you think they are caused? Is it dural expansion? Uh... How do you I think it's total expansion. Uh, they can be quite annoying. So the patients, uh, they are from PT, free of PT, but this pain is, is, is quite severe. So I had recently three patients uh, in the last yeah, four months that have uh, had severe pain. Uh, they improved from IAH, they improved from PT, but the pain has been quite uh, quite annoying. Uh, I have managed them with uh, occipital nerve blocks. Uh, they worked. And one of the patients, I uh, just sent to the pain clinic to do some Botox. And she reported uh, a significant improvement. But uh, I think it's, it's the dural stretching uh, related to the stent and the silver stent. Mm -hmm. is, is the stat that is more related to those headaches as well. Okay, one last question. Uh, what is your, your experience with angioplasty before standing? Have you ever done that or do I, you do I, I don't, yeah, no, I don't think, I do post stent. I don't think you need to do pre, unless it's a very tight uh, stenosis. Uh, I had cases that I couldn't go even with a microcatheter. I couldn't cross the, the the stenosis, and I was unable to even advance a five French uh, uh, catheter. So then I had to do a pre uh, uh, stenting angioplasty, but only in that scenario. I always do post stent angioplasty if I can navigate the stent system or the guiding catheter that I will use to deploy the stent. Okay. Uh, I think we covered all the questions. We also had a few questions from the audience, which we asked about the dual antiplatelets, etc. So thank you so much, uh, Professor. It was a, an amazing presentation, a pleasure for us. And thanks thank for you very much. Yeah, all we really appreciate time. you uh, coming in on your vacation. So thanks so much for being here, and it's great seeing you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye now.